If you drive your car at a perfectly steady 60 miles an hour, this means that you're changing your position by 60 miles for every time interval of one hour. This is called uniform motion, when equal displacements occur during successful, successive equal time intervals. A good example is riding steadily over level ground. Uniform motion is always along a straight line, as shown in this motion diagram. The displacements between successive frames, or dots, are, are equally spaced. An object's motion is uniform if and only if its position versus time graph is a straight line, as shown here. The average velocity is the slope of the position versus time graph. The units are meters per second. You find it as rise over run. In this graph, it's delta x divided by delta t. Things to keep in mind, steeper slopes correspond to faster speeds on a position versus time graph. A negative slope means a negative velocity. Uh, the slope is a ratio of intervals, not a ratio of coordinates. You can't just do x divided by t. You have to do the change in x divided by the change in t. That's important. Also, we're talking about the physically meaningful slope. So it is the, the rise, which is how far something traveled, divided by the run, which is actually a time interval in seconds. So this is not an actual slope in degrees. It's what we call a physically meaningful slope of a position versus time graph, which is an average velocity. The equation for uniform motion can be found by considering an object in uniform motion along the s-axis. So s is a generic symbol which could either stand for x or y, whether you're dealing with uh, horizontal or vertical motion, or even uh, diagonal motion. The object's initial position at time t sub i is s sub i, and at a later time t sub f, it's at some final position s sub f. We call the time interval delta t, and the final position can be found as the initial position plus the velocity times delta t. It's a nice equation. Distance is a scalar quantity, quantity which doesn't have a direction, but displacement is a vector quantity, which has uh, magnitude and direction. Speed is a scalar quantity in physics. It's what's read off the speedometer in your car, so it's always a positive number. But velocity is a vector quantity that includes direction. And if you're talking about one-dimensional motion, you can specify the velocity by, uh, by putting a plus or minus sign to indicate direction. An object that is speeding up or slowing down is not in uniform motion. In this case, the position versus time graph is not a straight line, but it's curved. And we can determine the average speed between any two times by finding the slope of the straight line connection between the two points. But what we'd like to find is the instantaneous velocity, the object's velocity at a single instant of time, t. It turns out that the average of velocity, delta s over delta t, becomes a better and better approximation to the instantaneous velocity as delta t gets smaller and smaller. This is called the limit of delta s over delta t as delta t approaches zero, which is ds by dt. Here are the motion diagrams and position graphs of an accelerating rocket. You can see here that the position versus time graph is, is curved, and the slope of the line which connects 1 and 3 is the average velocity between 1 and 3, but it's not the same as the instantaneous velocity at time t2. Now if we zoom in on this graph uh, right around time t2, then the graph is nearly a straight line, and the slope of this line is a good approximation to the instantaneous velocity at a time t2. The limiting case the instantaneous velocity at a time t2 is the slope of the line that is tangent to the graph at that point. So, summing up, as delta t gets smaller and smaller, the average of velocity reaches a constant or limiting value. This interval delta t is centered on t, and delta t approaches zero. In calculus, this is called the derivative of s with respect to t. Graphically, delta s by delta t is the slope of a straight line. 
and the limit as delta t approaches zero, the instantaneous velocity is the slope of the line that is tangent to the position versus time graph at time t. So ds by dt is called the derivative of s with respect to t. This is the slope of the line that is tangent to the position versus time graph. So if we have a function which is some power law, c times t to the power n, where c and n are constants, the derivative of u is c or is n times c times t to the power n minus 1. Another result is that the derivative of a constant is 0. If u equals a constant, then du by dt is 0. Lastly, the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. If u and w are two separate functions of time, then d by dt of u plus w is equal to du by dt plus dw by dt. So let's do a quick example. Suppose the position of a particle as a function of time is given by the function 2 times t squared, meters where t, the time is in seconds. What is the particle's velocity? Well, you can do the derivative using the rules of calculus and find that the function for v is 4t. So the position versus time graph is this curve, t squared, and the velocity versus time graph is a straight line, 4 times t. And as it turns out, for any point on the velocity graph, it, the velocity graph gives the slope of the position versus time graph at that same time. Here the value is 12 meters per second at 3 seconds, and the slope is 12 meters per second at 3 seconds. So suppose we know an object's position at an initial time, and we also know the velocity as a function of time. Even if the velocity is not constant, we can divide the motion into n steps over which it is approximately constant, and compute the final position as the limit as t, delta t approaches zero of the sum of the velocities times the delta t's. You can also use an integral, the initial position plus the integral from, from ti to tf of vs dt. Graphically, you can interpret the integral as the total area enclosed between the t-axis and the velocity curve. So the total displacement delta s is what's called the area under the curve, and we found this by dividing the area into small little rectangles of with the delta t, where delta t approaches zero. So the final position is the initial position plus the area under the velocity curve between ti and tf. A little more calculus. Taking the derivative of a function is equivalent to finding the slope of a graph of the function. Similarly, evaluating an integral is equivalent to finding the area under the graph of the function. If you have a function u, uh, which is a power law, c times t to the power n, where c and n are constants, you can find the integral of u as being c over n plus 1 times t to the power n plus 1. The vertical bar in this step means that the integral is evaluated at t sub f minus the integral evaluated at t sub i. And keep in mind this equation only is true if n does not equal negative 1. Also, if u and w are two separate functions of time, then the integral of u plus w dt is equal to the integral of u dt plus the integral of w dt. So, Let's look at motion with constant acceleration. Imagine we have a kind of a race where we're not looking at how far a car goes, but we want to see uh, whether a Porsche or a VW re reach a velocity in the shortest time. So which reaches the velo same velocity 30 meters per second in the shortest time. So here's a table of position or of time and velocity of the vehicles. And here are the velocity versus time graphs, all the way up to 15 seconds. So both cars reach a final velocity of 30 meters per second. So neither is faster. But the Porsche, for the Porsche, the rate at which the velocity changed was 30 meters per second 
over just six seconds. So that's five meters per second per second. Whereas the VW got to 30 meters per second over 15 seconds. So, we, so the Porsche has a higher acceleration. The SI units of acceleration are meters per second per second, or meters per second squared. It is the rate of change of velocity and measures how quickly or slowly an object's velocity changes. The average acceleration during a time interval delta t is delta v divided by delta s. Graphically, this is the slope of a straight line velocity versus time graph. Acceleration, like velocity, is a vector quantity and has both magnitude and direction. So here's there's three kinematics equations of constant acceleration which we'd like to derive. First of all, suppose we know an object's velocity to be v sub i at a time t sub i. We can then find the object's velocity at a later time t sub f as v final equals v initial plus a times delta t. That's the first kinematics equation. Now suppose we know an object's position to be s sub i at an initial time t sub i. So it has a constant acceleration graph. Here is the velocity versus time graph, which has a constant slope. The final position is equal to the initial position plus the area under this curve. And this is the area of a, of a rectangle, v sub i times delta t, plus this triangle, 1 half a delta t squared. This is the second kinematics equation, which is useful. Lastly, suppose we know an object's velocity to be v sub i at an initial position, and we know that the object has a constant acceleration while it travels a displacement of delta s. Well, you can go to your book and look at page 48, where they go through and derive uh, this relation. The square of the final velocity equals the square of the initial velocity plus 2 times a times delta s. And that forms the third kinematics equation. So there's three nice equations here. Okay. Here's a comparison of motion with constant velocity and constant acceleration. So on the left, these graphs are constant velocity. The position versus time graph is a straight line. The velocity versus time graph is a horizontal line. It's just constant. And the acceleration versus time graph is the zero. If you've got constant non-zero acceleration, then the velocity versus time graph is a straight line, and the position versus time graph is a special kind of curve called a parabola. So the problem-solving strategy for kinematics problems with constant acceleration, you model, you visualize by drawing a diagram and graphs. You can use the three kinematics equations to solve, and here you can use x or y as appropriate to the problem rather than the generic s. And keep in mind that for uniform motion, constant velocity, with, it, with constant velocity, you have a equals zero, which simplifies all of these equations. And finally, a set. The motion of an object moving under the influence of gravity only and no other forces is called freefall. Two objects dropped from the same height will, if air resistance can be neglected, hit the ground at the same time and with the same speed. Over on the right, there's an image of an apple and a feather falling inside a chamber in which all the air has been pumped out. And you can see this motion diagram that they're falling at the same rate. So two objects in free fall, regardless of their mass, always have the same acceleration, which is 9.8 meters per second squared vertically downwards. So here's a motion diagram of an object released from rest that's in free fall, and below it is a velocity versus time graph of the object. This velocity versus time graph is a straight line with a slope negative g, where g is a constant which is a positive number which is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared when you're near the surface of the Earth. This is not a universal constant. If you were on another planet, you might have a different value of g. But here on Earth, it's 9.80. So here's a motion diagram of an object which is sliding down a straight, frictionless plane. And below it is a picture of this uh, object on the frictionless plane with the freefall acceleration that the object would have if the incline suddenly vanished.
you can divide the acceleration vector into two perpendicular components, A subparallel and A subperpendicular to the surface. We can say that the surface somehow blocks the perpendicular component so that the one-dimensional acceleration along the incline is just A parallel. If you work out the geometry, it turns out to be G, the freefall acceleration, times sine theta, where theta is also the angle of the incline. And the sine is either plus or minus depending on which direction this ramp is tilted. So let's imagine we have an incline going upwards and we have a sliding object which is pushed up the incline, it's released, it goes up to some maximum distance up the incline and then turns around and slides back down. Okay. This is a position versus time graph for that object on the incline. The velocity versus time graph starts off positive, you give it some initial kick, and then as it slides up the velocity decreases and decreases until it reaches this turning point, the highest point that the object reaches on the incline. And then as it slides back down the velocity becomes more and more negative. And the bottom is the acceleration versus time graph, which is just the slope of the graph above it. And it turns out that this is always neg negative, and it's always constant. It's equal to negative g sine theta for this incline. Now, most motion is actually not a constant acceleration, but the acceleration might change. For example, here's a velocity versus time graph for a car leaving a stop sign. Initially, the velocity is changing very quickly, and then as the driver sort of releases the gas and starts coasting, the velocity gets, uh, is changing less and less quickly. So this graph is not a straight line, so it's not motion with constant acceleration. Here's the acceleration graph. The value of the acceleration is equal to the slope of the velocity versus time graph. Okay, so the acceleration is dv by dt, the slope of the velocity versus time graph at a time t. So suppose we know an object's velocity to be v sub i at an initial time t sub i, and we also know the acceleration as a function of time. Even if the acceleration is not constant, we can divide the motion into n steps of length delta t in which it is approximately constant. In the limit as delta t goes to zero, we can compute the final velocity as the initial velocity plus the limit of a times delta t, of all these, the sum of all the little rectangles. Using an integral, this is the initial velocity plus the integral from ti to tf of a times dt. Graphically, this can be interpreted as it's the initial velocity plus the area under the acceleration curve between t sub i and t sub f. 